Hi, good afternoon. Well, it's 12.01. I think it's slowed down the number of participants joining, so I think we've reached our steady state. Hi, I'm Kathy Bowles. I'm a professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and the director of the Healthy Aging Corps for the Penn AI Tech Collaboratory. Uh, this is our last uh, webinar for our 2022-23 series, and we invite you uh, to enjoy today and welcome you back in September when we'll, we'll start our series for 23-24. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Johnson. Kevin is the David L. Cohen University Professor of Biomedical Informatics, Computer and Information Science, Pediatrics and Science Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. So he has many jobs and many hats. He received his MD from Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore and his master's in medical informatics from Stanford University. Dr. Johnson is an internationally respected developer and evaluator of clinical information technology. His research interests have been related to developing and encouraging the adoption of clinical information systems to improve patient safety and compliance with practice guidelines. He's widely known for his work in e-prescribing and computer-based documentation as well as his recent creative endeavors to communicate science to the lay audiences, including a feature length documentary about health information exchange. Dr. Johnson is the author of over 150 publications and he has won dozens of awards over his career. Notably, he was elected to the American College of Medical Informatics in 2004, the American Pediatric Society in 2010, the National Academy of Medicine in 2010. That was a great year for him. And then the International Association of Health Science Informatics in 2021, and the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering in 2022. I'm sure the awards will keep on coming and you're in for a treat today as I turn the podium over to Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Well, thank you so much, Gabby. I'm going to try to share screen and not embarrass myself with poor technical prowess here. <laughs> yeah, I love see. when that happens at the informatics conferences, when oh, uh, oh. all the inf informaticians can't get the computer to work. It's always a good laugh. Yeah, exactly. So I think we're here. If I've got that right, that should be one slide. Is that correct? That's correct. It looks great. Perfect. Well, um, thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a fairly futuristic project that I, I hope I'll ground in some of the evidence to support its feasibility. Um, this is one of these projects that, as I've said to many of my trainees, not for the faint of heart, there'll be a lot of questions I'm sure about, can we really pull this off? But I think it's an infrastructure that will help me to do some work I'd like to do with computer-based documentation and work that I hope will help the rest of us who do research to use as sort of a, a data set that they can use. And this project is called the Observer Project, um, and it very much is inviting AI researchers into the exam room. Um, I wanna start off with my bias. Uh, this is um, a slide I made from a talk I gave later earlier last year about envisioning, envisioning our future partner in a partner in children's healthcare, could it be the EHR? And the point I was trying to make with this one slide was that I've always believed that we would have technology that would be our partner and that it would help with many of the things that we don't do as well as humans. And you know, I aspired as a physician to be a physician who with that partnership had a fantastic relationship with my children and their families um, and that with the tools that we built could help out my aging parents. Here you see a picture of my mom, my dad, and then the, one, the woman with the um, amazingly dark hair for the age hint, hint, um, is our aunt um, having a dinner at their assist in their assisted living facility. And I thought that the goal would be that we would have this partnership. This was a book that came out in the, in the kind of mid-90s, which is a National Academy of Medicine, then called Institute of Medicine book, called The Computer-Based Patient Record and Essential Technology for Healthcare. This book was almost like a Bible for many of us who were thinking about how we would move forward with the tools that were necessary to, to make the computer a partner. And it recognized that, as you see on the left, the computer-based patient record of the um, future 
would address the issues of wrong and missing data, which were the case for about 30% of patients, data issues of data sorting and inflexibility, issues of unavailable data or records, and then issues of things like disintegrated or non-integrated inpatient and outpatient records. It recognized using today's parlance that the systems that we had that were paper-based added cognitive load to care by having the wrong format, the wrong content, problems with access, problems with availability. It was very commonly the case that a patient would be admitted and no one could find their record. So we literally operated within a vac in a vacuum for days, um, as, always, as well as problems with linkage and integration, and envisioned that the future would be a system that was largely cognitively supportive with high quality, easy access to data, a system that allowed providers to integrate these data across time and settings, systems that made medical knowledge accessible when needed and provided decision support to practitioners. So this was where I saw us going. And it was very exciting to be sort of among the leaders developing systems toward this. This is unfortunately where we've ended up. We now have, in fact, everything about this picture except for one thing is accurate, according to Bob Wachter. Uh, this is a picture from JAMA in 2010. And it was drawn by a child who had who noted that their doc, his doctor or their doctor was using a computer but had his, his or their back facing the patient. The patient was on the exam table, Mo mother was nearby, and there were other caregivers in the room. The thing that's inaccurate about this picture is that the doctor is smiling because it's very rare these days that anybody finds the computer to be a partner. And yet that's the role, that's the world we're in. And largely it's because a system that was designed, we thought, to improve cognitive support, starting in about 2010, created much more work for all clinicians, nurses, advanced practice providers, physicians, and even sometimes patients, depending on the patient. And so more data, more foraging, um, but not better tools to lessen cognitive load on providers. In fact, this has been measured. This is a wonderful piece that came out of the Mayo Clinic proceedings a few years ago. And if you look across the system usability scale, with which many of you are familiar, the EHR score is a solid F. And the primary reason for that has to do with cognitive burden. Um, the, the issues that you see on the left of this teeter-totter um, are all issues that we would need to have go away so that we could focus our attention, our cognitive attention, on taking care of the patient and thinking about the issues that might be related to this visit or to their history. And that requires many of the tools that are on the right for the computer to be a partner. And that includes context-aware information summaries, goal-aware decision support. So if you're trying to do this thing, this is how you should do it. Automated prior auth, which is a big topic right now, detecting trends in, in everything that relates to patient care, automating documentation, patient-specific data retrieval, and care support in all clinic settings. If you think about the pandemic and imagine what it was like to have hospital at home, we'd love to see all of that to be as connected as what currently happens in hospital settings. And to get there, we are going to need to use AI. So Bob Wachter and um, Eric Topol have both written about this. These are books, if you've never read them, I'd recommend you read. Uh, Deep Medicine is particularly important to see now. Eric was a little bit prescient in writing this book. Um, he did a lot of discussion about deep learning at a time when not everybody was familiar with it, and now it's almost becoming commonplace. But then he builds on that to talk about our, what our future could look like. And then Bob Wachter's book is a very easy to read staple on the digital doctor. He's uh, the head of internal medicine at, the, at UCSF. And fundamentally, my, you know, thinking about my interest in computer-based documentation, the real challenge here is that the clinic visit documentation system, which is one of the ways we communicate, hasn't changed since the 60s. The model most of us grew up with was called the subjective objective assessment and plan model. And it's loosely problem oriented based on work that was done by Lawrence Weed in the 60s. That was typically scribbled notes until 2010. The big innovation was the invention of EHRs that allowed people to type or click those notes. And part of my frustration was that I was a part of that group of people. You may, I may have a chance to show one slide from one of our early systems that we built to demonstrate that these would actually not significantly impact patient-physician interaction. And I was wrong. <laughs> um, but you can see that this is when that picture came out. What I'd like to see us do now is to recognize that we are still on an evolutionary path and that the next step is to work on 
minimizing the role that the provider takes takes that looks like being a secretary and maximizing the part of the role that's all about cognitive support. So the sort of challenge in my communication and documentation center is what if instead of spending time documenting a clinical encounter, we can consistently spend that time engaging with the patient and the family because we rely on AI technology to summarize the clinical encounter qualitatively, quantitatively, and equitably. And so our approach is to start advancing the way we think of documentation using language and AI technologies to re-envision medical documentation, as well as potentially real-time clinical decision support. And we'll talk about what that means. So many of us don't realize, but the field of AI sense-making, AI enabling clinical care is incredibly far along technologically. Every, every technology that you see on this slide is being used in other fields and has been researched at various levels in medicine. And many, many people know about most of what's happening in machine learning and explainable AI, um, maybe a little bit less about perception, although you see it in other places. That includes using sensors. A lot of uh, Dr. Demiris's work obviously is in that space. Uh, those can be multimodal or wearable, 3D scene understanding, activity recognition, um, turns out we can do 3D reconstruction from 2D images, which is, can be incredibly important if you're looking at things like injuries and mechanisms thereof. We can use generative human models, which can be very useful for teaching, but also for activity labeling. And then there's all of these ways that we can um, assess language using real-time language translation. Anybody who's used GPT is probably very familiar with all of these. Real-time multi-person speech recognition and even sentiment analysis. And all of those features can be used in EHRs and in medicine to support spoken and unspoken summarization. Unspoken would be things like the patient is nodding in approval or rolling their eyes, or maybe even moving around, assessing cognition, detecting conscious and unconscious biases, quantifying activities, and identifying signs and symptoms of disease, as well as quantifying those. So think stuttering as an example. And then there's gonna be other things that as we think more and more about the ways these technologies can enable clinical care that people are going to think about. But the key thing is, none of this has been translated into anything that revolutionizes clinical care today. It's a series of toy systems that have never been brought together. And so our thinking is that technology has the opportunity to refocus providers on patient interaction um, can, to use real-time clinical decision support to expand researchers' access to data so that an entire campus or an entire country can use interdisciplinary research to think about med problems that they themselves might be experiencing in the healthcare system. We can do that through automatic beyond speech documentation. We can do that through uh, tools that improve processes as well as that assess quality and improve it. And then, of course, it's also a visit archive. If we were able to actually store these data they become a visit archive and a summary tool for patients and for families. So lots and lots of options. Some of you may be familiar with MIMIC. MIMIC is a system that was developed and is developed in Massachusetts. It's a terrific system. It's primarily using ICU and ED-based admissions to get a data set consisting of um, the data that you see on the left. So monitoring data, chart information, tests, orders, billing information, demographic information, and notes and reports to some extent. It creates a data archive that's de-identified and then is made available publicly with a, with a, at a site called PhysioNet. If you've never used it, I would highly recommend that you do. The current version is MIMIC 4. However, you'll also note that on the right, MIMIC, like a lot of these data sources, and, and possibly like what we're going to gener generate with Observer, has to be used carefully because medical data have significant vulnerabilities and by the way, veracity problems. So it's entirely possible that developing a system like this for AI will always have biases that need to be understood, but will also have uncertain data or missingness and other challenges or re-identify and re-identification capability. And for that reason, you won't see yet anything that looks like a video version of Mimic. And our goal is to try to start developing a video version of Mimic. Um, just a couple of examples of some of the opportunities that were in these previous slides, and just to show you some of the research and how long it's been around. Uh, so Jim Fackler and some colleagues from Hopkins in March of 2013 started using 3D sensing, and that means using depth cameras primarily, to build an intelligent ICU 
which allows you to know who's in the room and what they're doing and perhaps what's happening in response to what they're doing. And I won't go into the detail, but there's this has been well-studied work. I will tell you, because I've talked to one of the major um, developers of it, Suki Saria, who's the last author. Um, I don't think she's on here, but if she is, hey, Suki, that um, this was really hard work to do. Getting their consents, getting the room outfitted, very difficult. Similar work was done using video detection of cognitive impairment, and we'll come back to this. But the idea is, that many of the forms like the um, what's called the MOCA form or other forms for cognitive impairment um, can be automated, at least in the research world, with a reasonable AUC. And you can see that there are ways to possibly increase it, uh, increase the AUC, but they're not necessarily what you'd want to do clinically by, for example, excluding patients that have typical comorbid conditions. But the idea is that we know that there are technologies that demonstrate the possibility. Another one that I'm really excited about is being able to look for nonverbals, things like patients expressed emotions and clinical responses. And there are a number of studies in this space, but this is work that I think we can all we can use to inform the kinds of ways we might be able to use audio and video analysis. Another one of my favorite projects is work that was done by co our colleague Fei Fei Lee at Stanford and Marty Milstein's group, looking at the idea of using depth cameras to actually detect whether patients are being exposed to doctors and nurses who have appropriately cleaned their hands before entering the OR. And that was simply done by setting up these cameras above the hand hygiene dispenser and clocking who's coming in and how long they're spending as a way to show that it could be done. Um, this was actually one of the first projects that really showed clinical applicability of some of the work that we could do with real-time decision support. So. Another area that's especially of interest to a group like this, since AI tech is focusing a lot on aging, is frailty prediction. And you might ask, why do you need to predict frailty? The, the answer is, number one, because we need more people to help identify these patients early. Um, frailty predisposes to other morbidities and mortalities and leads to challenges with aging in place. In my parents' case, we, de we detected that there were issues, but frankly, the healthcare system didn't, and it took quite some time for us to start getting the resources that were necessary. Undetected dementia in the community, which is going to increase over the next few years, is estimated at about 60%, and that's often because of a lack of time during a primary care visit, which is where most of these patients are, or a lack of training and confidence among generalists performing evaluations, as well as this incorrect perceived futility of the diagnosis. It turns out that there's a lot providers can do for a patient who's at risk, and I won't read this list here, but note that this is a great thing to screen for because we do have potential ways to address it. There are guidelines in place to talk about frailty, and those guidelines have, there are many versions of them. This is one that um, shows um, a lot of the different tools that are available in terms of scoring. What I've done is extracted out some of the key components from frailty indices. And they are things that you can see on a computer on a screen. So you can detect low activity, you can detect exhaustion, you can detect slowness. We think we can detect postural instability. Obviously, over time, we can both measure and detect weight loss. We can detect things like slow to rise up from a chair, and we can watch social support happening in the room and measure it to some to some extent. From a standpoint of cognitive impairment. We can obviously do some tests that are based on tools that are already around for memory and cognition. Um, we can also look for true impairment of memory, cognitive impairment, especially when it comes to things like completing uh, complex everyday tasks, which are doable and happen all the time in the exam room. And then cognitive impairment may be associated with a dementia. So we can look for evidence of dementia. So all of those things that I showed essentially are attributes that are typically not always documented by primary care doctors who are seeing the patient for very different issues. But for example, one of the, some of the things that could be added are going to be shown on the right. This is from a visit of a patient um, to the adult primary care clinic. And you can see this doctor wrote a very kind of tight note with active problems. The patient complained of knee pain for a week on the left, um, had a history of arthroscopy, but didn't have any evidence on the exam of effusion or weakness, and then there are some prescriptions and there's some other things. So a very tight sort of physical exam and then an assessment that says there's some knee pain, um, we'll notify if it gets worse. 
Well, what could be added? Well, what if we looked at that patient's gait and said that in the video there were 15 seconds that were of, of gait that were unchanged from previous visits, that cognition had normal word finding, normal focus, that sitting to standing took four seconds and they used the arms. And you can begin to see these are data that might be present in a video of the room. That during the visit, there was 10 minutes of provider talk, five minutes of patient talk, and there are norms and there are stair standards for what constitutes the amount of time each should talk in certain types of visits. Maybe there was 10 minutes of discussion about arm pain. The patient had a knee issue. There was no image taken on the left, but why not? Why, if the doctor didn't, if the doctor was looking at the knee, didn't we snap an image just so that they would have the baseline? The patient was a little anxious during the discussion. Might have been evident, but maybe not reported, but could have been determined qualitatively or quantitatively using the video. There were things that weren't discussed, and there were plans that weren't documented, and that's, a, that's something that we can get to by actually looking at the note in real time and making sure that we ask people about it. So this, to me, is next-generation documentation. To get there, I want to start by collecting these data. Um, this is the project called the Observer Repository. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about um, much of it in detail, but I just want to give you a general sense of what is required for us to do this. This project, by the way, is IRB approved, and we have very good provisional news about funding. So first aim will be to create this repository. The repository is going to consist of a number of data types, but two of the big ones are a video of the clinic encounter and commentaries by the provider as well as the patient about the visit that just occurred. All of those data will be placed into a repository. Aim two will be to use machine learning techniques to identify the clinically relevant features of the type we just described. And we'll do that through a combination of concept extraction, interaction analysis, activity labeling, and identifying gaps in patient care when we can find them. And then the, the hope is that by aim three, we will have shown some prototypes of AI supported clinical care using both an automated and unbiased summary as well as AI augmented assessments that can be used for all of the things that you see around the picture here in black, process improvement all the way around to the right to research and education. Part of the way we're doing that is using egocentric cameras, which you can see here is my colleague Eric Eaton and I, both wearing a camera that makes us look like we've just defected from the Borg. For those of you who are Star Trek fans, these are cameras that actually see the exact same thing that we see, which includes if I am looking at my screen, which allows me to see the EHR data. We tested last summer a few different setups for cameras, including body cams, and we found that the egocentric camera was the one that most consistently is providing the picture that we want to see. This is a picture from our simulation where our work in the simulation center last summer as we were preparing for this project. And you'll note if you look around, cameras in kind of every angle. Uh, this was for us to test a lot of different cameras to get a general sense of what's necessary to do the kind of activity detection that we'd like to do. But fundamentally, what we're going to do is to take this video and extract from it its audio. We're also going to get the EHR data that relate to this visit. We're going to use sensor technologies that we can um, when necessary or when available. We're going to have the provider's commentary and the patient's commentary where they've actually watched the video. The patient will be watching the video right after the visit in one of the exam, uh, an open room counseling room, and they're going to tell us what they what they saw, how they felt. We're also going to ask both the patient and the provider to complete a one-question satisfaction survey to get a general sense of whether they got their go whether their goals were achieved during the visit. Um, these are examples, and I'll just run this video, but you won't hear anything, but these are examples of the kinds of data that we'll be capturing, um, which will include the actual visit that's happening, um, we have data from the exact from the actual EHR. So here's some snapshots of the EHR, I think. And here's her logging in. And you can see that these are aligned. And so this is one way that we can capture it. We're actually choosing to do it a different way. For those of you who've never seen an epic screen, you've now seen an epic screen. And then to the right, you can see what are look what are EHR audit log data, which are very, very useful in terms of seeing what's been done in the EHR to try to solve whatever questions are being brought up by the patient and the provider. So this very complex slide is the, is the architecture that one needs to create a repository of the type that we're building. And that includes all of the data that you see 
put, coming in through that pipe on the left in green, and then a series of pre-processing steps to make sure that we have the data at the appropriate level of quality, that we have all of the derived features, and we'll talk a bit about that in a second, that are, in, that are integrated with the other data, that the data are de-identified. They have to be at the, at the very least for our IRB HIPAA Safe Harbor compliant before we can share them, um, that we use quality control to make sure that we have um, data that are appropriately fit for the types of analyses one might want to do. And then everything to the right of that really just has to do with how we create a storage environment and a retrieval environment so that people who are from the far right looking to the left can create studies that are based on creating a cohort of patients, reviewing their data, and doing sample-specific analytics. So this is a resource that we'd like to develop and we're working on now for engineers and social scientists to understand and improve outpatient care. This is the part that we're going to talk about for a little bit now. Um, I want to note that you know one of the number one challenges with a video with a setup like setup like this is going to be converting the video to non-human subjects data, which includes de-identifying the text and the audio, blurring out images, or potentially doing what is commonly called deep fake, which is essentially replacing a person with an avatar of themselves, and then doing audio de-identification. This project sinks if we um, don't do those things, and we need to be able to do them well enough to get patients to be willing to participate, as well as providers. Uh, by the way, we already have providers that are now signed up. Um, we'll be sending up, signing up patients within next month. Um, we also want to make sure that we deal with the hurdle of representativeness and bias, and that's a challenging one. I'm not going to discuss it, but if you bring up questions, I'll, happy, I'll be happy to tell you what we're thinking about. And then finally, making sure that we don't have any accidental disclosures of personal health information. I put this slide in to just remind everybody who maybe isn't familiar with it that it's what, you know, there's always data leakage. Every study that we've ever done or that many of you have done have probably had something that are that is with the data that might be a little bit concerning. This really has to have a minimum of leakage, meaning we need to make sure that it's very, very difficult to re-identify these data to make this a shareable resource. We can do a lot of work with the data that are de-identified, but we also are going to need to do a little bit of work with the identifiable version before we share it to do some of the metadata collection that we need to make this useful. One of the things we're going to do, for example, early on is what's called pose identification. There are many available, um, available tools off the shelf that can find a person in a video and create points within that video of the parts of the body that might be moving. And those um, allow you to know what positions a person is in, what activities in which they might be engaged. Um, there's wonderful work by one of my colleagues here, Ling Ji Lu, but there are many others looking at scene and actor reconstruction without identification. So essentially taking the gentleman who's got the yellow shirt and using techniques to do 3D reconstruction and make a non-descript uh, version of him, but as you can see, faithfully reproducing hand positions, feet positions, et cetera. There is this entire set of work that, that has been done using what are called generative adversarial networks. Um, essentially, it's very clever. One, what you do is you take, a, um, if you start on the left, you take a user's facial expressions, capture the motion, identify the key points. You then take another face, and in this case, we, this should probably be reversed, but you, you then take the, let's say the Tom Cruise face, and you place that into the same facial expression prediction touch point points, and then use general adversarial networks to try to simulate movements. And the goal is that one GAN is attempting to do face replacement. Another GAN is attempting to identify whether this is a whether this is with what with high probability a particular person. And when that particular GAN gets to the point at which the gener the generated avatar has a 50-50 chance of being guessed correctly, we know that we've maximally faked the avatar. So there's a there are a set of experts, um, a guy named Isan Hoke, who's at Rochester, who's been working on this, but others here in our robotics group are quite good at this. And this is a technique we will explore as we begin to bring, bring get some of the data available for doing it. Speech to text is a very important part of this because we do have these audio files. There's tools that have been, recent, been recently introduced by OpenAI called Whisper. There's also one called Google Cloud. There was a tool called, and there is a tool called Otter AI. We've decided not to use Otter 
primarily for those of you may know, because there has been at least a little bit of a concern before about Otter's security model. And with these types of data and the fact that Otter is only cloud-based, we had some concerns. Whisper can be downloaded to a local desktop. So lots of issues. Filter is a tool that was developed by a tool Butte and colleagues in San Francisco. That's one of the nicest of the de-identification tools. It's been very well studied and we use it at Penn and other organizations use it as well for their biobanks. And so we're already using Filter to do all of our text de-identification. The reason for all of this energy is because for this to be a useful tool, we need to make the data findable, accessible to everybody who's a researcher, interoperable and shareable with other data sets, and reusable. And that's the so-called FAIR standards. An example of findability begins with the information that we were just describing, which is being able to create cohorts. So if you said, I'd like to find all of the patients who were satisfied with their visit, and then look at some of the interaction that happened with the, with the clinician and the patient, you'd want me to have come up with a way to find satisfied patients or to find patients who had a specific type of exam. Those cohorts would be based on structured medical concepts, uh, things like the reason for the visit, activities that occurred during the visit, interaction types, and we'll talk more about that, and other aspects of the visit that you would like to search on. One of the biggest challenges in the computer space right now is identifying who is speaking and being able to figure out the interaction of those, of those speakers. Uh, again, without spending a lot of time technically describing this, because I want to make sure we have time for questions, there has been a fair amount of research in diarization, it turns out that about the best we're able to do with it as an error rate, and you can see this on the right using the whisper tool called Pionote, is about a 23 or 24% error rate. We may have a great, a great piece of news that we got out of the lab yesterday. And we think we might have actually cracked this number significantly, but we have a few more experiments to do to prove that that's true. Um, but the whole idea of speaker diarization, requires being able to detect the voices, determine when there's a change in speakers, which is called segmentation, exact same sort of process as we would do with images, then understanding speech turns, um, who is speaking when and when there's a transition, and then using that te technology to identify how many people are in the room and who is speaking when. And so um, all four of those steps really have separate approaches that can be used and pipeline together to do diarization. The reason for me being so focused on interaction analysis is frankly because that was one of the tools that we used early on to figure out whether these computer-based documentation systems would be valuable. Now, this is a system I wrote back in 1995 this is a picture from 1998 when we did a big study of it, which is a system called ClickTate, which was in use at Hopkins for about 10 years. And essentially this was a point and click clin uh, clinical documentation system, very, very reminiscent of what you now see in Epic. It also included dot phrases for those of you who know Epic. Um, we did a study um, with Deborah Roeder, who is the scientist you see in the upper right, where we assessed, we assessed, it, assessed the overall impact of ClickTate on patient-physician interaction. And you'll note that even in our early slides, the, um, the screen position mattered, and we showed this in every single presentation, and make, making sure that providers were trained in how to use it while still engaging with the patient were a big part of what we discussed. This is some of the components of the rotor interaction analysis system that you see on the left here. It includes uh, areas like per personal remarks, laughing, showing concern, and the idea is that you take diarized speech, and so you see that on the bottom of the screen where the D means doctor and the P means patient, and you label every utterance with one of the codes in the rotor interaction analysis system. The rotor interaction analysis system, also called RIAS, has had great predictive validity with patient satisfaction, with, with um, understanding an effective communication of information, also, by the way, has predictive validity when the negative with patients who are more likely to sue or to be litigious, and therefore has had a lot of access or a lot of use around the world over the last 30 plus years. We believe that using RIAS, which I did for ClickTate, showed manual approaches to collecting all of these things, sitting, standing, body lean, hand movement, feet movement, gait assessment, computer use, and when certain activities were taking place. And we now have a group actively working on those those videos um, of our two of these two people. By the way, this is a video of a standardized patient 
and one of the doctors from our team, Anna Morgan, who's a terrific internist. So our next set of work is all about labeling what's happening during these visits. Again, using RGBD or other strategies, we can do automated activity lab labeling. It's been done before at Hopkins. Um, we have a pipeline. I'm gonna skip this slide in the interest of time, but I wanna recognize that our students, Cook Jang, Gene Park, and Sydney Pugh are working on an approach to do some of the video labeling that's highly medically specific. And we're doing that primarily by starting with existing um, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, um, using a, a resource called Hugging Face to identify those that are the closest to the types of activities we expect to see in healthcare, and then using reinforcement learning to improve those. Some of the classes of features here, verbal interaction analysis, nonverbal interaction analysis, it's very important that we understand when the computer is a part of that discussion in any way, and that might include positive or negative talk about the computer, because social scientists are going to want to know about that. Um, it might be very useful to know when the computer is providing value. We want to understand, of course, when we see obvious signs of disease or symptoms. We're very interested in sentiment analysis, something that has been done quite a bit. We think it's been done, by the way, just with words, but we, we believe that there's going to be a way to enrich that with video. We also are looking for, as I mentioned, clinical conditions and gaps in care. Um, steps to creating this repository include creating a set of technology that is easy to use. We're using an OWL as one of our backups. Those of you who've seen that allows you to basically get a 360 degree room view with directional mics, which are all built into this one device. And the, the, the picture that's generated looks like the picture you see right here, 360 degree view with every single person who's been talking the last three having their own picture sort of pulled out of, out of that picture. Uh, we're using egocentric cameras. We're also going to need a laptop. And as you can see, this is a very complicated process. We also have a big operational team. So one of the things we need to work on is how we can make that smaller. Uh, that's going to be one of our most important activities for equity. In terms of project, project, uh, project impacts, um, I've talked about most of these, but I wanted to just show you this one picture. Um, we believe that if we can do this in real time, we can use uh, resources like FHIR or others to send information into the EHR describing alerts like gate abnormalities and encouraging screening. So as you might imagine, one of the early outcomes of a study like, of a project like this will be to get at least some real-time clinical decision support in front of the clinician and to see whether that actually changes the way care might be delivered. And there are a lot of very interesting, similar types of alerts that we could produce. It also turns out that people have been starting to do observational work because we believe that some of the different ways we communicate may be better than others. And this is a study from one of my colleagues, Angela Bradbury, who was kind enough in her lab to provide us with telemedicine visits that have been audio taped and we've de-identified those and are using that to detect sentiment analysis. As you might imagine, she's a genetic counselor. There's a lot of sentiment in these visits. And so it's a kind of a, it's almost um, not quite shooting fish in a barrel, but it's a pretty easy way to test some of the algorithms that we can build. And some of the things that she's been looking at are whether adherence to certain screening behaviors might change with different ways of accessing the provider. Telemedicine, face-to-face -face phone, these technologies that we're developing could support that kind of work. So I wanna stop there and make sure we have lots of time for questions. It looks like it's 12.40 PM, so that'll give us plenty of time. But I wanna acknowledge that this is the group of people who've already been collaborating with me on developing this project. Um, this doesn't include, um, I should have a slide of this, but it does not include the about 15 or 20 patients now that we've had a chance to meet with in an advisory panel, as well as a number of providers from our first set of clinics who are helping us to think through all of these issues. So with that, um, I'm looking forward to this project going onward and um, us learning a lot from it and making some differences in what we can diagnose in terms of aging patients as well as other patients. And I will stop there and answer questions. Thank you, Dr. K Dr. Johnson. That was terrific, really interesting. So we do have several questions. So let me go ahead and get right to it. Sure. Um, this question says, first of all, thank you for a great presentation. Can you speak to whether you envision the observer technology being used in non-clinical settings? 
They say that um, community health workers and patient navigators also do critical work with uh, patient populations uh, out in the community or in their, or in their homes. And it'd be interesting to study that, that, those interactions. It sure would be. So I see this as two different projects. You, my obvious interest here is thinking about how we reinvent documentation. But everybody else's interests should be supported by the second project. We have put in a grant to create this new repository. And this data sharing tool is the way in which I see that happening. Once we can establish the way in which IRB documents need to be constructed and the tools that need to be put in place so that we can make these at least HIPAA safe harbor compliant data sets, then I think getting other groups and other settings to, to contribute data to this, to use for research is the absolute next thing to do. So it's a great question. I thought you might be asking about other settings like education. So for example, for nursing education or physician education, we know that it's gonna be useful for that. In fact, the CEO of the University of Pennsylvania, Kevin Mahoney, gave me a $50,000 pilot so that we could begin to use this in um, patient, uh, patient access, but to use this in physician education. So no question we're going to find other uses for this and have a chance to talk about them. And also no question that you're going to come up with other uses of this, and that's why we're building it. Yes. One of our other questions is asking about the home health setting. So with the nurses visiting patients in their homes. Yep. So that would be a tough one to set up the technologies in that home. But um, again, it'd be a great, a great setting. Yeah, right, Kathy. I think the key to a lot of those other settings, especially in the home, is both the access to and what we've learned from telemedicine. Because now that we have the ability for a caregiver in the home to establish a connection through Zoom or Teams or whichever tool you like, why aren't we recording those, right? Why aren't we learning something clinically about the setting around that patient? Where is the bathroom relative to the bedroom? How many stairs does that patient who's on cardiac rehab have to go or go through to get to the kitchen? Um, and I can tell you from my experiences as well as some of my colleagues, there was so much learning about patients during the pandemic when we had an opportunity to see them in, the, in their actual setting that really affected the care that was being delivered or at least being considered that I think being able to capture those data, learn from those data, predict things from those data would be very helpful. Perfect. Yeah. Another question. i curious to know more about the plans for developing equitable sentiment analysis, given that there can be significant bias around assigning mood and affect to communication, such as angry Black women or labeling women as, as hysterical. Really such an important question. There was a piece in NPR this week that was talking about some of the unseen um, audio from George Floyd. And one of the observations that was made was that in the setting where police begin by giving an order, as opposed to begin by asking questions, the sentiment um, is very dramatically different. And by the way, the outcome is predictably worse. So no question that there are these really giant equity and trust issues. And by the way, I know you know this, so I'm only gonna say it to the few people who haven't thought about it. The challenge with this project is it's a study. Patients and providers have to consent. So we will likely have a giant bias of people who actually are highly trusting, experimental from the very beginning of the study. So what we have to do is to have some successes with the easy population. And as much as I hate to do it that way, I just can't see my way around it. I decided that one of the things I'm gonna do here in, in, at uh, Philadelphia that will make this easier is I wanna get Temple in the room fairly quickly so that I have at least one group of clinicians who come from an environment which would be wonderful to be a second adopter to help us figure out, you know, are our engineering approaches to this tractable in that setting, in their settings? Or are there ways in which we've thought about developing our materials as a science communicator? Obviously, that's interesting to me, um, that we can use. Um, I just finished a study here looking at how we can get African-American parents to increase their enrollment in clinical trials. Um, using a, ser a series of what are called inclusion appeals. Um, I actually have the results from that. You'll see them in a paper pretty soon. But the bottom line is those are the types of techniques that we need to bring to trying to deal with some of the equity issues, as well as, frankly, having real data that we can show people so that we can demystify what this all looks like. Great ideas. Uh, next comments. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Two questions. 
how will the MDs be protected from liability issues with having footage of their work? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, how will you account for cultural differences in facial and body language gestures? Yeah, right. Absolutely. So I'm going to make this really simple. The second question is we don't know yet, right? So this issue about cultural variation in facial expressions, for example, certain populations who don't smile as much, and that's back to the sentiment, but other aspects mm -hmm. is a challenging question. I don't have a great answer. Mm -hmm. The first one. So I have to have a series of meetings that I've yet to have with our legal and ethics departments. I've had one meeting with some ethicists here on campus, and it went quite well. Everybody has the same questions about um, concerns, both about patient patients who may have access to these videos at some point and what that means, and providers who, even though they may be de-identified, might be more easily re-identified. So we are going to de-identify all people who are in the video, except for innocent bystanders. Um, we may have to de-identify them by just blurring. We won't have their names, but we won't necessarily shift their audio. Um, and we have to talk through all of that and understand the risks and make some decisions about how much information loss we have. As you saw, we can use depth cameras or often called connect cameras, which is what uh, George Demiris, for example, uses in the home setting, which is completely de-identified. It's essentially silhouettes of people. And as long as you don't capture their audio or as long as you change their audio, they're essentially not identifiable. But we have to capture at least some of the text from that visit. We have to de-identify that text. Those of you who know about named entity recognition recognize that it's possible to slip things through. Part of why Mimic doesn't want you to go to GPT is that even though they may have fully de-identified the text, nothing prevents the um, audio or the, or the transcript from saying things like, you know, I have to walk a long way from the chancellor's office to the dorms which might tell you a lot about who the eye is. And those types of things, which may be in the data, are useful to have in the data, but could be used for re-identification. So what Mimic does is they, and what we'll do to start with, is anyone who has access to this will sign an attestation that they will not attempt to re-identify the data. That is actually the same process that's being used by all of us, for those of you who know about all of us, and for most people who use biobanks, because all of those data that have unstructured information have some re-identification risk, according to experts like Brad Malin and Ellen Wright Clayton. So it's a long answer. The short answer is it's a thorny issue. We're going to work through it with our legal and ethics department to see what's possible. And that's why I got a second grant to think about the data sharing piece. Wow. Very important. Very important. All right, next question. Uh, great presentation, such a huge project. I think you partially answered this with your comment about inviting Temple in. So this person wants to know, is it possible to form a consortium of academic centers doing similar work? Yes, the answer, it's a, it's a, such a, it's a good question to ask. Mm -hmm. I believe the answer should be right now, let's prove that we can start. Um, yeah. Yeah. The problem with the consortium, I think you all have been on them, right? The problem with the consortium is, that you can have analysis leading to paralysis. And what we wanna do is demonstrate a lot of things. One of the questions you haven't asked that's been asked of us before is, do you really need the video? Because the video is gonna be the thorniest piece of information. Um, is there some way to capture most of what you wanna capture from just the audio? You know, Because with audio, as opposed to with a transcript, I can get sentiment. I may not be able to get all of it, but I can get some of it. With audio of the EHR screen, I can blur out I, I can blur out identities to a large extent without having to really worry about people feeling concern. And so we want to learn all of that. And as we find out what's necessary, that will help, I think, for us to decide what consortium members we should be inviting. One of my plans is, if all goes well this year, to capture 100 patients in the system by the end of 2023 or early beginning of 2024, because we're about a month behind. And I'd like to then do pilot projects. So that'll give us an opportunity to create a consortium who are actually using the data. And that's the plan I'm currently thinking through. And of course, to the point of the equity group, that's also a place where I'd like to make sure that we have a really balanced group of investigators thinking not just about the engineering questions, but about all of the other aspects of what I think is broken in healthcare that could be fixed with this. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that leads me to this question. So burden, EHR 
documentation burden is such a such a terrible thing for providers. How do you see this work as solving that issue? How, how will this video, these sensors, et cetera, make things easier for us? Yeah. You know this, um, but I've been very active with the Amy at 25 by 5 community. Um, this is one of the initiatives that we've been doing to try to decrease documentation burden to 25% of what it is right now by 2025. Uh, we're saying now probably 2026, but 25 by 5 sounds really good, so we're going to stick with that. <laughs> um, and, and we're on our way to at least figuring out how to measure it. Um, I could give an entire separate talk about some of the challenges. I wrote a paper with Bill Stead uh, that, had, that does not have that teeter-totter but has a table version of the, of the, the teeter-totter, um, basically with the title of um, getting from a safer to a smarter EHR, precisely because we've got to address the burden issue. I see this and revolutionizing documentation as one of the ways to do so. Many people think that the use of um, large language models and ambient listening, sort of the ambient scribing model in the outpatient environment, as well as in the nursing environment, is going to be really helpful. I think it will be really helpful. And in fact, I'm working on an op-ed to discuss, discuss the point I'm about to make. Um, it's, called the, it's called the demise of the busy signal. But the whole idea is using large language models when a note length right now is at least 14,000 characters, okay, is going to make a longer note. We already know that. It's going to still require some time after visits, some time between visits, because there will be errors. And the worst part is it's not going to help the reader at all. <laughs> and so there's two sides to this equation and there's burden on both sides. The best note for me as a physician is the one that I don't have to write at all, but it may be the worst note for you as a reader, either because there's nothing patient comes in and there's no note because I said, Oh, guess what? My burden's gone. I don't have to take any notes anymore. Or because I said I had the whole thing transcribed verbatim. And that means you have to listen to a beautifully summarized possibly with all of the key non-medical things excluded version of my note, but it could be quite long. And so to get that technology right, we're going to have to have multiple iterations of what the receiver wants to see, not just what the, crea the creator doesn't want to spend time doing. Wow. All right. Sounds like it's a, a, a ways out. Ways future. out. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Next comment. Your work gives me hope that AI can be used ethically for individual and societal benefit. However, it appears computationally expensive. How can you reconcile the ethical use of AI and health data with the rapid commercialization of AI? So I wish if that person were on this so I could see them, I have to ask <laughs> a question first. Do you want to address the computationally expensive piece? Or do you want to address the rapid commercial adoption of AI piece? Because they're actually different. Mm. I'll address them both. Okay. Um, I'll just try to address them quickly. Computationally expensive. Everybody here who has an access to large language model GPT is sucking up the carbon footprint rapidly to do things that they possibly could have done without GPT. So if I were in the room with a bunch of people, I'd say, don't even talk to me about carbon footprint because you've probably asked GPT to create a poem for you and you have no idea how many GPUs it takes to do that, right? <laughs> so that's part of the answer. There is a thing we have to do better. And one of the active work, some of the active work that's going on, as I understand it, both in OpenAI's community and in talking to Peter Lee and the Microsoft community is to come up with ways to do what GPT does in a much smaller platform. There are some models that are currently available online. If you go to Hugging Face, you can find them, uh, just as there was with BERT. So some of you may know about BERT, and then a light BERT, also known as Albert, came out. So we're hoping the same thing's gonna happen with GPT, but it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. The other piece of this. So part of, part of what I think might help me to get us to adoption is that I was a CIO for five years at Vanderbilt, and I installed Epic at Vanderbilt. So I've done some big things with our vendors and they know me pretty well. Um, so my hope is that we will, be, we will be able to partner pretty quickly with what we've learned and coming up with strategies to implement it. My personal bias, which some of you may know, I can't tell who's on the call, but some of you probably know this is, I don't think there's a lot of IP here that we shouldn't just give away. I think the problems are really quite big, but once, as you can tell from what I said about OpenAI, once they get to the point where they're solved and people have written papers about them, they are re-engineered and made available for free anyway. 
So my view is what I want is a group of people who are going to deal with the regulatory concerns, concerns here, the integration concerns, and think creatively about how this can genuinely improve healthcare. Most of you won't buy this, but I really do believe that our EHR vendors want to be our partners, but that we aren't necessarily speaking with one voice. And I have lots of experiences to describe, to talk about that if you want me to. Uh, we aren't speaking with one voice about what we need. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to speak a little bit more clearly and have some tools that can be in place that demonstrate where we want to go with studies that demonstrate why that matters and that they'll pick that up the way they've picked up my dot phrases. Great. I guess this would be the last question. So who are the funding sources that you go to that are interested in advancing this kind of work? So I've been, I've been slow to go to them. And in fact, what I should ask is if anybody has ideas about places that I should go, I will absolutely entertain the possibility. So far, the NSF, there are three biggies. The NSF, the NIH, and ARPA-H are all very interested. Um, I think we're hoping optimistically we're going to hear some good news from the NIH. Um, we are not yet gone after um, smart and connected health money, but our plan was to look at the NSF smart and connected health grant this fall. Um, and ARPA-H, we have just put in where we're about to put in the BAA, the three-pager, for those of you who know about that. ARPA-H is a really interesting opportunity. And just because I'm using this as a sort of a work in progress talk, I should probably tell this audience that ARPA-H is looking for program managers who have very innovative ideas and will lead multi-billion multi dollar efforts inside of ARPA-H to move those ideas forward. So although we might create BAAs and get some number of millions of dollars to execute a problem, you can get an order of magnitude more money to be a program manager in ARPA-H with a portfolio if they pick up that idea. So I would, I would argue that some of what we're talking about, rec recognizing the aging population that many of us are in, represents a really great area for ARPA-H to think about. How do we revolutionize aging in place using technology uh, and maybe even processes that are different? So that's an opportunity for funding. There are smaller groups um, that are interested in parts of this, but I think the first part is demonstrating that it's valuable. And then I can start getting a lot more funding to do specific projects, or you all get a lot, a lot more funding to do demonstrating to do specific projects with this resource. Perfect. Wow. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much. This is really fascinating. And I'm so happy to have learned more about your work. So I hope, hope to see you on campus. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And I want to remind you that all of our webinar series are available on the Penn AI Tech YouTube channel. So please go ahead there and visit them and watch them early and often. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.